or up? Oh, on, on. Hit on. All right. Hello, my name is Carl Deems, Dr. Carl Deems. Uh, presently, we're in Sussex, uh, New Jersey. Is that right? Are they in Sussex, yep. New Jersey? Sure and uh, we're uh, doing a couple of videos today. We've already did one video on uh, God's light, the light of the world. And uh, we're talking now, we're going to talk about where did it come from? And this is just an expansion, kind of a science lecture on uh, where did it come from? It's kind of asked the question, you got some things out there in the universe that are pretty spectacular. You know, evolution tries to explain some things, but it can't explain, uh, well, it, can't, it really can't explain where life comes from, and it can't explain how we get all the species and all. Evolution can't do that, they, even though they say it does, it does there's, no, there's, nothing, uh, there's no factual truth to it. It's more, it's more a dogma, it's more of mythology than uh, true science. But I'm not really going to talk much about uh, evolution today. What I'm going to just talk about is let, let people think and, un, and try to see where did this come from? Because everything has to right, work right the first time, and it has to work together right the first time. Um, and we'll go through some verses. Uh, uh, I have a, a website, burningbrightministries.com. And uh, you can get some more material uh, on that site. Also, this is being recorded on uh, VETL, V-E-E-T-L-E, -E dot com. And you can go into my uh, TV station called Burning Bright TV. And it's all lowercase, Burning Bright TV. And uh, hopefully we'll get it up on the website and uh, maybe on, on YouTube uh, shortly, but it'll definitely be on Vimeo. So uh, we're going to talk about where did it come from? Now I've got this picture up here, a bunch of pictures you can see. I've got a magnet, I've got a uh, picture of uh, a planet with a ring around it, some, some other planets. I've got light going through a glass, I've got a web, a, a spider's web, I've got an ant here, I've got a bee's hive. Uh, this is an hourglass, this is a picture of, of time. And then uh, Got a picture of Calvary here, and then I got a picture of um, a nucleus with some electrons spinning around. Now, obviously, that's a that's a that's a that's a cartoon of that. And uh, but we'll talk about all these things as we go through the go through the lesson. I want to start off with some scripture first. Actually, let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you help me do a good job for you and your people and those that might be seeking you. Pray, Lord, this would help them uh, get just draw that much closer and maybe help them understand some of the things that we understand from the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Where did it all come from? Well, the Bible says it came from God, but if we, if we put God out of, the, out of the equation and said, well, God didn't exist, I'm going to show you some things in the next uh, few minutes that would say it had to come from somebody. Um, it had to come from something. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't have a computer program without a programmer, for example. Uh, so it had to come from somewhere. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Another verse that I like to use, uh, actually you can go to, uh, let's, go to let's go to John. I like, I like the book of John. Some verses of scripture here. Of course, as a Christian, we believe God created all things, and uh, it came from God. But some of these things that he created, uh, if you didn't believe in God, you'd have to take a step back and say, well, where, did, where in the world did it come from? If, if, if God didn't do it, you know, where did it come from? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And without him was not anything made that was made. Go to Hebrews, uh, we'll go to, well, let's just go to Colossians. This is another favorite verse of mine. Uh, actually, let's see. Uh, well, let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the word are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, that they are without excuse. Another verse, uh, Hebrews, or I keep saying Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, we'll start in verse uh, 16, for by him were all things created, 
that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So who have we, who have we heard from uh, today? We've heard from Moses. Uh, we've heard from John. We've heard from Paul. We hear from Paul again. How about David? Let's go to Psalms. All these people believe that God was the creator. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Handy, his hand. He made it with his hands. Handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night utter knowledge, or showeth knowledge, um, being another word for it. We, we, it comes from, science comes the word, uh, a Latin word, scientia, or something like that. And uh, it just means knowledge. There's no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. And um, go to Hebrews. Hebrews. This will be Paul again. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands, thine hands. They shall perish. Here's the hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Uh, let's, I think, let's go to, it's 2 Peter, 2 Peter verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from beginning of the creation, creation. Um, it says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, hereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. I'll do another verse, Hebrews chapter 11. It's all through the Bible. The Bible makes no uh, excuse, doesn't, doesn't apologize, it says God created everything. Uh, let's see, Hebrews chapter 12. Yeah. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We, where we hear that before? John chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the, beginning, uh, in, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear invisible things so uh, God made the heavens and the heaven and the earth and the heavens and the earth we have, that's what the Bible says but let's just look at some of the things that he made and just kind of look at it let's just kind of look from maybe a skeptical standpoint and we look at some of these things that well where in the world did this come from first thing we'll talk about is uh, magnetism and here you got a mag magnet we got a north and a south pole we call it north and south pole we got a magnet and it attracts iron and that had to work right the first time. And there's certain laws about magnetism that we can understand. Uh, and uh, we can know how much, how far away something and the size of something it will reach out. Uh, a strange thing about uh, magnetism is we can take electric, uh, electric uh, energy, put it through a wire, and make an armature and spin that wire around, 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 around. And with that electricity going through that armature, uh, we can make uh, a magnet. And another thing that's strange about magnetism is I can take that same magnet and I can spin it around, 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 and I can go reverse and I can make electricity. Michael Faraday found that out, I think, in the 1700s. Now, how do you explain that? Where did that come from? In other words, I can, I have a, a, a force in nature, it's called magnetism. I can't see it. I mean, I can see the result of it. I can't see it. I mean, it's not something I can see. Uh, it's something I can measure, but I can't see it with my eyes, I can't feel it, touch it, but I can see the results of it. Uh, not only does it attract items, but electric current through an armature, or around a, around, if I put a, a, a wire around this iron nail here, and turn the power on, I could make that a magnet. But the way your altern alternator works on a car, is it does a reverse process. My motor spins, turns a belt, which turns the uh, 
turns the alternator inside. There's a mechanism inside the alternator that that uh, spins spins a magnet, and then it goes. That magnetic field, as it's spinning, creates electrons. And that had to work right the first time. Where did it come from? You got a, a north and a south pole, and it's based on materials. Not all materials have the same type of magnetism as other ones. Iron, everybody knows about iron. But there's certain, certain, and to a certain degree, everything has some magnetism to it, but uh, some are just worthless. In fact, some we can, uh, you know, you, you make them as insulators if you want. In other words, if I, if, I were to, if I were to put a magnet here and put enough material between here and the magnet, well, I guess it would be distance, uh, the iron wouldn't, wouldn't, attract the, wouldn't attract the magnet, okay? Uh, it wouldn't attract the material. So I've got this material right next to the magnet. It won't attract it. But if, if I put enough of it here, it, I can make a buffer to where that iron is so far away that it's the weak, the attraction force is very weak, okay? But that material will not be attracted to the magnet, so it's not really an insulator like in the way of a, you know, a copper wire or stuff. But I can build if I can build distance now, um, then. I, but that magnetic force will go right, will go through that material. It won't attract it as heavily as it will that iron that's on the other side. So weird material, weird material. Uh, how about the gravitational force? I've got this picture of these, this uh, ring going around this planet. It's just an imaginary planet I put. You look at all the galaxies that are out there, and you know these spinning galaxies with the uh, all this cluster of uh, stars in the middle, and then they have stars around the outside, and they're all spinning. That's all based on gravitation. Uh, Newton worked on gravitational forces. Uh, you had Copernicus, and then you had Tycho Brahe, and you had uh, Kepler. All those men. Uh, they gave us the laws of motion, gravitation. That's why you're able to use your global positioning system today. That's why you have weather satellites today. It's all because they figured out the gravitational pull. That gravitational pull is not just for things that are big, but also things that are small. Uh, the bigger the mass of something, the more gravitational pull it has. And granted, uh, there's all kinds of theories, of, you know, uh, the idea of gravity being a kind of a, a, a round uh, bowl that things fall into and all in, in space and time. That's, that's, but as far as Everyday uh, operations, uh, we think in terms of orbital mechanics. Okay? Now, where did that come from? That had to work right the first time. In fact, gravitational pull has to work right with magnetic, the magnetic pull, gravitational pull. Again, it, we can't see it. Uh, we can't discover it. We know we think it might be waves. It might be a little bit like uh, magnetism, but we, we don't know. But isn't that interesting? Now that had to work right the first time because if it doesn't work right, if it, if the gravitational constant changes just a little bit, a little, a little more, a little less, everything explodes. If it's too much, it implodes. If it's too little, it, it explodes. Uh, you change the 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 uh, gravitational pull of the sun just a little bit, the Earth would just go right in, go right into it. If you if you if you just give it a little bit more oomph, everything starts spinning right in. Eventually, it would spin right into the sun. Everything is just, just so. Gravitational. Where did that come from? I mean, I'm not so, you know, think about, not just think about the planets and all where they came from, but where did this idea of gravitation come from? Where did this idea of magnetism come from? You need magnetism, you need gravity. How about light? Here's light. Uh, in the last presentation, I talked all about the properties of light. Light will go in through a glass, bend, and then come out, uh, it'll be uh, the speed of light going in, slow down going through the glass, and then speed up again. Through light, we get, uh, light will go through a solid object, light will bounce off, that's why you can see these images here, it's because light is reflecting from photosynthesis, from light we get uh, solar power. Light has a tremendous amount of different properties. It had to work right the first time, so you got magnetism, gravity, and light, electromagnetic forces. And we still don't know about much about the universe because the universe is expanding. So the physicists are postulating this. Maybe this is a dark energy, or uh, what they call dark energy, or or uh, dark matter out there. Uh, we don't even know what that is. Well, that had to work. if it is if there is such thing as dark energy and dark matter, it has to work right the first time because the universe is expanding. 
We just figured this out in the last 10, 15 years. Hey, with the Hubble telescope, the universe is expanding. All those laws, all the physics, everything has to work. If you just take an infinitesimal, 1 over 10 to the minus 19th or whatever, change gravity, you're done for. Either way, it has to work right the first time. Talked about light. Talk about uh, another physical property. Let's talk about the atomic force. Now, this is a very cartoonish drawing of what goes on inside a nucleus. Uh, when I was growing up in high school and uh, even through college, you had protons, you had neutrons, uh, you had electrons. You had the protons and the neutrons. Neutrons don't have any force. Protons have uh, positive force. Now they have up quarks, down quarks. I think they've come up with about 12 different subatomic particles that are out there now. But just for the purpose of, which is even in itself a miracle that there's that many different particles, and they all have to work together, and they all have to work right, and they all have to do, the, the, the up quark has to do with the down quark, and all that stuff, because you need so many quarks to make a, a proton, so many quarks to make a neutron, etc. But here's the thing. When I was going through high school, Brother Ed, when I was going through high school, I understood that the electron had a negative force, negative uh, charge to it, and the proton had a pro positive charge, and so therefore the electron was attracted to the proton, right? Okay. And when you have two, uh, you know, two north poles on a magnet, repel. Two south poles on a magnet, repel. Well, the same way in, a, in a, an atom, at least that's what they explained to me, if you have two electrons and you try to push them together, you know what they're going to do? They're going to repel. If you have two protons together and you push them together, you know what's going to happen? They're supposed to repel. Wait a minute, but they don't. In the nucleus, they don't. They don't. So I'm in a college class, and I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the Air Force Institute of Technology, and I'm sitting in a college class, and they finally let us in on this secret. This is the secret. Yes, electron is negative, proton is positive. On normal, at normal distances, whatever, you know, you're talking subatomic particles, but at normal is whatever that normal is, protons will repel each other. Are you listening? Protons will repel each other. But if you get them close enough, you push them in close enough, they will attract. That is called a strong force. And I'm sitting in class and I'm saying, you've got to be kidding me. They're calling it a strong force. Well, I know who the name, I know who that is. Go to Colossians chapter 1. And we may have read that already. Go to Colossians chapter 1. I'm sitting in class and they call this a strong force. In other words, it defies intuition, folks. It defies your intuition. It defies your intuition. Your intuition is that if they're positive, they will repel. But when you get them in close enough, they will, have, they will attract. It's called a strong force, and they can, you know, they can draw the, they have the equations for it and everything. Paul says, for by him were all things created, Colossians 1.16 that are in heaven and that are in vis earth, visible and in invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So, as far as I'm concerned, the strong force is Jesus Christ. He's what's holding everything together. Yeah, but you got this strong force in here. Now, how do you explain that? That has to work right. If you change the strong force, infinitesimally you change it, make it a little weaker, the only, the only element you're going to have in the universe is going to be hydrogen, probably. Just change it. Or if you make it too strong, everything you can't, you, uh, everything kind of works its way down and it just turns into a big mush. It all collapses on each other. If you would have told somebody in the 1800s that I can take two pieces of rock and force them together and have an explosion that would destroy a city, would the people in the 1800s believe me? No. Let me tell you a story I had when I was working in the Air Force Technical Applications Center. I was a, probably a major at the time. And I'm sitting in on this briefing. And uh, our, our charter in the Air Force Technical Applications Center was to detect nuclear explosions in the atmosphere and space. We had space uh, assets that could do that for us. We had seismic. And it was all part of the treaty monitoring system that was set up in the 1960s. We don't want people cheating and testing their weapons in the atmosphere and space because they had, atomic bombs tend to be relatively dirty. <laughs> they tend to send out radioactivity. 
for those of you who remember the uh, all the all the thing about the uh, Fuk Fukuyama or whatever uh, nuclear reactor on the coast after this after that earthquake, how they were concerned about the radioactivity getting out into the atmosphere. So big big thing, big and nobody we don't want anybody cheating. Yeah? So, uh, but we had a scientist that came in and was in in the early '60s, maybe just before the atomic '50s. And of course, I'm dating myself a little bit. I I was in down there probably around 82, 83. No, it would have been 87, I would have been down there, okay, 1987. So this fellow is elderly, very smart, was one of the, guy, one of the guys that worked with uh, the Manhattan Project, and he come in and he started to tell us a little bit about the atomic, atomic bomb and what he, what he had seen. He's one of the few remaining people alive who had actually witnessed the atomic bomb. Now, you don't witness the atomic bomb, you more or less feel it, okay? Because he was 30 miles away from the bomb, and the bomb... Of course, they wear these sunglasses and everything, and they turn their backs on it, and they shh, all of a sudden, you know, boom, there it goes. Well, the light's the first thing to get to you. Then I think the shock wave is the, you know, the air shock wave gets, you know, the sound of, you know, 30 miles away. So they see this big mushroom cloud. Then a little bit late, they see it. Uh, then, they, then the shock wave gets to them. And then... Uh, I can't remember exactly how long he said it took him, but it was maybe five minutes or six minutes. Then the ground wave came, they're 30 miles away from this thing, and knocked them all down. Okay? And that's from probably a piece of fissionable material about the size of my hand. That's how, or maybe twice the size of my hand. Unbelievable amount of energy stored up in that strong force. Okay? And you know what that scientist said? He says, the only way I can explain what I saw and felt was that it was God-like. That's a quote from him. I wish I had to remember his name. But he said it was God-like. You take a little bit like this, and it's enough to knock him down 30 miles away, five minutes after the explosion. So you don't want to mess with the atomic force. Now, I'm just saying all this to say this. It has to work right the first time. It has... Now... How many molecules do you think are in your body? Just in your body. All that stuff has to work. Electrons, protons, neutrons, up and down quarks, 12 different sub-nuclear sub things. You know, all has to work right the first time. You've got magnetism, gravity. You've got light, electromagnetic energy. Some you can see, some you can't see. Some you use in uh, fiber optics. That's why you can, uh, you know, get uh, 27 channels on your TV and everybody else can. It's because of fiber optics, because the light has a, an infinite number of frequencies. You've got the subatomic force, okay? How about, how about the radiation from my, um, uh, like uranium, where it decays? All that has to work right. All that stuff has to work right. Let's talk about something that we, we, we know about, but we can't see. A couple of things. Time and space. Time and space. We perceive it. As human beings, we do, we have things, and I teach a seminar on this, time management. Time management is nothing more than life management. Because you have to control your time. When you're controlling your time, you're controlling your life. Right? A lot of people try to take your time, steal your time, and, other, and then sometimes you just waste your time. <laughs> we call it wasting time. Sometimes you can redeem your time, you can buy it back, like we're doing right now, we're making videos, and we're putting it on multiple platforms, and so we're redeeming some of that time back. The time that maybe we wasted yesterday, uh, you know, we can redeem some of that back, you know, we can redeem some of that back by doing multiple things in multiple places. In fact, in my time management, I try to teach people, it's best, it, the way to use your time wisely is to, find, to be in multiple places at one time. Multiple places at one time. I'm getting off subs here, but multiple places at one time. The first people that were able to do that were the scribes because they were making copies of intellectual property. Intellectual, things that they had understood, things that they had, they had written, and they were writing it down. They were making copies. So now there's the one, the original, and then they would make copies, and they'd send that out. Okay? So they could be, their intellectual property, what was in their brain, could be in multiple places at one time. Uh, the, uh, then they came up with uh, something that really was uh, fantastic, 
was, and of course you had the printing press, again it's still printed material, but when they came out with radio, just think about radio, radio, which uh, God invented, but radio waves. Through radio waves, a person could be talking at a microphone and be multiple places at one time, radio waves, at least you could hear the guy. Uh, Thomas Edison was able to take a phonograph and actually produce uh, your sound, your, phon your, your sound, and it was able to uh, transmit it to multiple places at one time. The guy that invented the, pho the, the photography, you could take a, multiple pictures, make copies of it, and it's almost like going back in time, but you could be a multiple, at least your picture could be a multiple place at one time. TV, same thing. Now we've got the internet. Now we've got the internet. And those that are watching this right now on the internet, I'm here in New Jersey. I don't know where you are. You could be in China. You, we had people that watched this in China, Philippines, Australia, England, all over, okay? Be in multiple places at one time. So that's time many. But time, what in the world, where did that start from? This is in the beginning. Uh, Einstein talked about the weird properties of E equals MC squared. He talked about if you, get, if you can travel close to the, the speed of light, time slows down and all that stuff. Well, as far as we're concerned in our Newtonian uh, physical universe that we're in, for the most part, that doesn't affect us. Because <laughs> we're, we're not going to go at the speed of light anytime soon. All right. So time for us is go tick, 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 tick. Have you ever noticed it's called temporal distortion? If you're, uh, you're at a traffic light and you've got to get somewhere, do you ever notice how long it takes for that traffic light to turn? Yeah. All right. That's perception. That's time perception. Time is still going at the same rate. It's been going at the same rate all since the beginning of time. A day, a day, a day, a day, a day. But perception, temporal, that's, that's us. Perception, okay? Another thing about time uh, is if, uh, if you're in a... Uh, we found this in fighters. I flew fighters and I taught life support. Uh, guys will get are, are getting ready to eject from an airplane. And they will say that they will hit the, the ejection seat, pull the handles. They will watch everything happening in, as if it's in slow motion. They'll be able to see the canopy disappear. Then they'll hear the charge go off. But they're all... And, but, how fast is that going? It's going in less than a second. They're out of that airplane. The two of them, less than a second, out of that airplane. And yet they see it in slow motion. That's time. That's, that's perception of time. But real time just going... Ch -ch 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 -ch. We have atomic clocks. They're so accurate. You can figure out time. Uh, you can set your watch to them. <laughs> okay? And what if, God, what if that wasn't so? What if that real time did go back and forth and, and warped out on you? Well, maybe you might miss a dentist appointment. That might be good. But uh, on the other hand, you might miss your wedding because, uh, you know, time might be different in New Jersey than it is, uh, you know, as far as how it progresses. It might be different in New Jersey here in Sussex as it is uh, three blocks down the road. That would be, everything would be all fouled up. Time has to work with gravity, has to work with light, and has to work with magnetism. All that stuff has to work together, has to work together. Where did it come from? Where did that idea of time come from? In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The Bible talks about the end time. End times. It says in uh, Revelation chapter 22, talking about a time at the end. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no curse, but the throne of God, the Lamb, shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God reigneth or giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Eternity. You know, that's something we don't understand in a, in a mortal sense. We're born and we die. We see death all every day. Death happens every day. Time. That's why I call time management life management. Because you only get so much life. And then you're in eternity. God created life and created time.
Uh, we find that in, in the book of Genesis, evening and morning were the first day. Evening, morning, evening, morning. Time. God created time. He also created space. Uh, we talked about the almost the infinity of space. We haven't seen the end of space. But you can't have many things if you don't have any place to put it. Yeah, if you have things, you got a place to put it. Yeah. God created space. We height, depth, length, right? Three dimensionals. Fourth, fourth dimensional might be uh, time, whatever. You know, they talk about different multi-dimensional universes. But as far as we're concerned, in our Newtonian world, Newtonian physical world, there's up, down, left, right, forward, backwards. That's it. So time and space. Where did that come from? The idea, concept for space. We just take it for granted. We take it for granted space. We take it for granted time. We take it for granted gra all these things. We talk about a spider web. We talk about we talked about physical things now. You know, kind of physics, the hard science stuff. Now let's talk about stuff uh, with respect to animals and the physical kingdom. There's a there's a spider web. Now, can you imagine trying to evolve as a spider, trying to make a spider web? <laughs> How's that going to work for you? Just, I mean, just think about it for a second. I mean, don't, don't, don't say, uh, you know, don't say it was super mutation or something like that. Well, if it was, then it had to work the right the first time. Because a spider, if you think about what a spider has to do to make a spider web, that thing had to work the right the first time because he's going to try to catch some bugs. Because if you don't catch any bugs, there ain't no more spiders, there ain't no more baby spiders to yep. make more spider webs. You ever think about that? <laughs> spider web? No, some of you guys, some of you folks out there have never thought about that. But that spider web had to work right the first time. Where did that come from? That idea of a spider web. Where did that come from? There's all kinds of spider webs. And you know, they are fantastic. If you wake up in the morning and you see spider webs full of dew. It's amazing that little, that little spider can... Do you know, and I don't know if you know this, but do you know that that spider web is some of the strongest material known to man, is that spider web? Now, they've come up with something, and recently it's, uh, it's the shape of a hexagon, strangely enough. It's called, it's one thin sheet of carbon. One th thin sheet of carbon, I mean one atom thick. And that is probably stronger than a spider web. But it's, it's six carbon atoms like this, and you make them out in a sheet. Make them out in a sheet, it's called graphene, and that stuff is super strong. It really quit. Come back on there, I just noticed it, it just, it just went bloop. some of this, but I was talking about time and where time comes from and where space comes from. And you can't have stuff unless you have space to put it in. And then time, time management, time temporal distortion, all that stuff, I talked about time. But time had to work right the first time. And we talked about the uh, spider web. Spider web had to work right the first time. Uh, and and uh, that little spider, think about that little spider. He comes up with the most amazing engineering feat because that spider, uh, spider silk is stronger than almost anything known to man. That we, that, I mean, in the in natural world. This is the natural world. I've talked all about the, the physical world uh, up till now, but now I'm talking about the natural world. Of course, there's graphene. I was talking about a little bit about graphene where it's six carbon, um, atoms in the one layer, one layer of carbon atoms, and that's proven to be one of the strongest materials, even maybe even stronger than spider web. But spider webs, think about it. How do you catch bugs if you're a spider unless you can make a spider web? And that had to work the right the first time. Another thing that's kind of amazing is flying. Flying had to right, work right the first time. You don't take a bird and jump off a, a 40 story building because you know what's going to happen, it's just going to go splat. And there's all kinds of ideas of how that happened, but you, you, know, you know, a bird, if you look around today, and you look around, you see a bird, they either fly or they don't. Right? How did a bird learn how to fly? How did it learn to get those feathers? How did it learn? Where did it come from? 
the idea of flight. We didn't fly in an airplane until 1900. 1900 AD is when we started flying in an airplane with the uh, Orville Wilbur Wright. And now we've got rocket ships and etc. but it's still a tremendously technologically complicated way of flying. There's hang gliders uh, that, are, that fly around, but they don't go very far. They don't, they don't have, but how about, the, and then you've got the hang gliders with motors on them. They don't go very far. But how about that bird? That bird can land in trees. That bird can, can uh, uh, fly great distances. Uh, it's self-replicating. I mean, the whole thing of a bird is amazing, right? If you like chickens, now chickens uh, are self-replicating, right? And uh, where all that stuff come from? Where, where do they come from? Spiders. That spider web is the most amazing thing to me when I see a spider web in the morning. How about a bat? I'll give you another example of a bat. Bat has to catch bugs. Bat uses sonar to catch bugs. That has to work right the first time. That has to work right the first time. You can't have a bat that doesn't have sonar. Uh, you know, one generation will just, disa it'll just disappear. If, if a bat does not have the, that that you see flying around today, and I think there's like a thousand species of bats. If it doesn't have the sonar, it's done for. And that we just figured out how to do son sonar and that type of thing in the 1940s. And you got to think, how did that animal figure out how to do that? How does a porpoise know how to do that? How does a whale know how to do what it does? Where does it come from? In the animal kingdom, it has to work right the first time. I've got the ant here. Ant is a social animal. If, it, if it's not social, if, ants, if all of a sudden the ants decide not to be social, they're dead. They're done for. You got a queen ant, you got drones, you got worker ants. They all work. They build ant hills. Everybody's seen those things. They're dumb animals. They have to know. How do they, how do they know? Where did that come from? Where is that intelligence? Where does that intelligence come for that ant to know what it's doing, for that um, um, spider to know what it's doing? Where does the intelligence come to know, for that bird to know how to fly? I mean, I, we've got little, uh, we have uh, at our house, usually in the spring, the birds like to make a little nest in my, my bushes. And every once in a while, you'll see the little bird, they'll hatch, you know, and then they'll be walking, and then they, they fly off. Now I had to go to I had to go through special schooling to learn how to fly just an airplane. <laughs> Those birds don't go through any kind of special. I, and my understanding is that what an eagle does with an eagle, it just throws it out and the, throws it out and then sees if it can learn how to fly and grab it. You know, I mean, there's no you don't go to school if you're a bird to learn how to fly. That's I know we call it instinct. I, my question is, where does that information come from? Where does that in, instinct come from? Again, I used an illustration last time I was talking. A computer program has to have a programmer. That information comes, doesn't come by itself. It comes from a programmer. An ant, social an animal. A bee, a social animal. Um, they have a social order. They know what to do, when, and um, they must cooperate. Bees are the same way. You have queens, drones, workers, and nurse. They all have to work together. When, when there's a threat to the nest, everybody works together. What kind of information? How do they pass on information? I know they say that the bees do the uh, dance. Where did they learn how to do the dance? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? This structure right here, remember I, I just talked about carbon. It's a hexagon. This is the strongest, the strongest uh, um, structure, strongest way to make a structure with the most space. If you saw, if you didn't see this, if you didn't see this honeycomb, you saw this all, you'd think that something was wrong with the wet, it was high, that they'd been uh, gassed. If you didn't see this picture, I have this picture up here, and you can see, you say, oh, that's a honeycomb. That's a beehive. How do you know that? Because, like, for the last uh, 6,000 years, that's the way bees made beehives. 
They know how to make that. They knew that, that the strongest way to make a, a structure with the most internal space on it was a hexagon. They knew that. How did they know that? Where did it come from? Well, it came from God. Look around. Do you see anything around you right now, if you're watching on this video, just take a look around your room, and is there anything in that room that is there physically that wasn't made by somebody? Chairs, buildings, floor, autos, watches. Is there anything you can see that it wasn't? Why was it created? Why are you sitting in your chair? Why are you looking at through, through a computer? It was made for a purpose. It was made for the purpose of the Creator. Right? In Revelation chapter... Revelation 4. The reason why something that you're sitting on a chair and the reason why you're doing what you're doing is because it was made there for a purpose. It was made there for a purpose of the Creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4, verse 11. You say there is no God. Okay, then explain where all this stuff come from. Uh, if you have a computer, there needs to be a programmer. If you have DNA, there's all kinds of information on a DNA. Where did the information come from? Where did the information come from from that ant? Where did the information come from for that uh, spider to build that web? Or for the bat to be able to know how to uh, find a bug in the middle of the night? Where where did the information, let's, let's, let's get in the physical world, where's the, phys, where's the information that tells the ma a magnet to act the way it does? Or, what is it? The leader. Oh. Uh, or gravitation, or light to act the way it does, or time, or space to act the way it does, or the strong force to act the way it does. You say, well, that's just physical, that's just physical laws. Well, it came from somebody. You don't have a law in this country, United States of America, that wasn't put together by somebody. They call them laws. The Bible says that uh, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. And the Bible says in, in him, all things consist. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, all things consist. The Bible says... Uh, for God so loved the world that Jesus, Jesus' words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's the Creator. He gives you all the, all the universe, the works of his fingers. He shows you all these marvelous things. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmness showeth his handiwork. He shows you all these things. And yet you sin against the holy God. We all do. The Bible says, for all have come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. So you see death already. God didn't create everything to have it die. I mean, he didn't create the moon. Think about it. The moon's got all kinds of craters and stuff on it. You've got these rings around Jupiter, and you've got the asteroid belt. And all. That's, that's a evidence that something went wrong. Yeah, I know it's great and all the creation and everything, but something went wrong. It's called sin. And it pervaded the whole universe. Looks like. It definitely perverted. It definitely uh, per, it's, it's pervasive among uh, human beings. You just have to open up your paper yeah. and watch your TV. Sure enough. Sin is pervasive. Where did it come from? For the wages of sin is death. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, through Adam all die, but through Jesus Christ you can live. God had a way he knew before the foundation of the world, it says, that he's going to die for sinners. He's going to pay the place. for the way, take, take our place. For the wages of sin is death. Well, if I can get a substitute, if I can find somebody to take my place, then I wouldn't have to die, right? Well, God, the only one that can take my place, I can't have Brother Ed die, die for me. He's a sinner. You can't take me. You can take my place, but God is not going to accept it. No. Sorry. No, no, You're not good enough, Ed. Sorry. Uh, no. No. 
or Pastor Struble here at the church. By the way, this is, uh, you want me to give this advertisement? Before you close. Yeah. yeah, this is Solid Rock Baptist Church. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we're at Solid Rock Baptist Church here in New Jersey. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ came, he died for our sins. That's God manifest in the flesh, died for our sins, was buried, and the third day rose again according to scriptures. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He created all. And he saw that man was going to be a sinner. And to show his infinite love. I mean, this shows his infinite power. This shows his infinite wisdom. This shows his infinite understanding. But how do you show your infinite love? Well, you have to have an enemy. Jesus said, love your enemies. So for the last 6,000 years, mankind has been making enemies. Us. So to show his love, he came and he died. And I played. If you'll receive the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, say, I know that I'm a sinner and I have and that and that uh, I believe Jesus Christ died for me in my place personally for me in my place that he was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures and you receive him as your savior say Lord save me I don't want to go to hell I want to go to heaven when I die he'll do it Jesus said you must be born again you say well that's too supernatural I can't believe it well look at all this stuff how uns how supernatural is this it come from it's not much of a leap really to see that Jesus Christ came to this earth that he's the creator and he says to you that you must receive him as be your savior you must understand that you're a sinner and that the blood of Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness and that you receive the Lord Jesus Christ it's not it's not really that much of a leap of faith uh, to accept what he's what he's done for you on the on Calvary he had three, so, we, had, we had three men on Calvary's hill. He had a thief on the right and a thief on the left. And then he had the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle. One thief made it to heaven. One thief didn't. One thief made the paradise. One didn't. What's the difference between the two men? Was it because they went to, one went uh, to church. Uh, one got baptized. One gave money to the church. One did good works. No, they had a chance to do that. The only difference between the one that went to heaven and the one that went to hell is the one that went to heaven received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. The difference between the thief that went to heaven and the one that did was that the one that went to heaven had Jesus Christ. That's the, that is it. Had Jesus Christ. All right. So I hope if you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, I would I would pray that you would do it today. Um, again, for those of you that uh, might be tuning in late, uh, I have a website, burningbrightministries.com, Dr. Carl Deems. Uh, you can actually Google Carl Deems, and I think it will take you right to my website, or at least a, a link there. Uh, but I have other videos there and some supplemental uh, material and some handouts that you can uh, download. And then also we're, we're videoing right now on BEETLE.com and we have, uh, it's Burning Bright TV. We have a lot of videos on there as well. Recent videos, the last uh, uh, couple of months, some, some recent videos. So uh, those are for available. And then presently I'm at Solid Rock Baptist Church and it's in uh, Sussex Borough. It's off of uh, Route 565. Sussex, New Jersey, and uh, Pastor Dave Struble is the pastor. Want me to give the phone number? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Right. Amen. Phone number 973-702-1611. And they're hosting this weekend. We're uh, starting tonight at 7 o'clock and then Saturday night at 7 o'clock. And then uh, regular, the regular services on Sunday, we're doing science in the Bible. So these uh, presentations were uh, maybe... Uh, I, I won't have time to really cover these presentations during the seminar or during the conference, but uh, uh, we'll be talking more about what science is, what science is not. We'll be talking about the hindrances that, or the systems of unbelief and the systems of belief. Uh, we'll be talking about the history of science, and we'll be talking, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the resurgence, if you will, of theistic or creation science, and we'll have some... Uh, we'll have some discussions about uh, Darwinism and all, but uh, the main uh, main thing I want people to get from the conference that uh, will be there and that we'll be having is that science, true modern science started as a result of Christians 
that uh, got uh, got free from Roman Catholicism in the in the during the Reformation and during the Renaissance. And most of the modern disciplines of science that you see today, physics, new physics, uh, um, magnetic, uh, um, uh, like uh, Michael Faraday, um, the idea of uh, differences in species and trying to uh, put them put them in uh, different categories like phylum and all that was a Christian. All these modern things that we uh, take for granted today, they had their beginnings, their birth with Christians. So uh, Christianity and science can work together, and uh, and uh, but it has to be true science. It has to be true science, and so. Uh, if you can come to the conference tonight, and I hope you'll get a blessing. We got a lot of I got video, I got some short videos, and I've got a lot of different pictures. So I think it'll be a blessing to you if you come. All right, uh, let's close in prayer, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for the opportunity to teach and uh, teach on, on the things that you created. Pray, Lord, to be a help to your people and also help to those that are you. Pray, Lord, that some folks within the sound of this voice would receive you as their Savior. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.